I want to look at uh, Philippians chapter 3 before we look at Romans chapter 12 because they are similar in, in their motif. Uh, Paul, writing to the Philippians, uh, says this to them about how he lives his Christian life. He says, uh, not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on in order that I might lay hold of that which was uh, laid hold for uh, by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it, that's italicized, yet, uh, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies ahead and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal of, for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. What's the it? It's italicized uh, in, uh, in the text that you have in your hand. It's not on the, the, on the screen, but it's not in the original Greek text. Uh, what is he talking about? What is that which he is uh, trying to obtain? Uh, the first clause says, not that I've already obtained it, but it's uh, um, denoted in the second clause, which says, uh, or have already become perfect. Uh, that's the Greek word telos, which means uh, complete by design, finished, a final product. Uh, and so Paul says, I haven't yet reached perfection. Well, what kind of perfection? Well, uh, in the eschaton, in the end, when you stand before Christ, you as a, as a Christian, will, everything that Christ has given you will be realized. You will be perfect, spiritually, morally, on that day. But Paul says, I haven't achieved moral, spiritual perfection yet, uh, but that doesn't keep me from pressing on. And he uses the word press on two times. Uh, the word for press on is a, is a, uh, a term uh, that denotes moving quickly towards something, purposefully, going after it with great zeal, or as they would say down south, whole hog. <laughs> okay? Man, I'm going after this. What? Whole hog. I'm going after it. Going after what? Maturity. That's what, Paul said. That's what Paul says I live for. Uh, and he says, I go for this goal. Uh, skopon is the Greek word. Uh, and it means to uh, keep your eyes on the finish line and, and be one who crosses it. What's the finish line for the Christian? Maturity. That I grow up in the faith. So that each day I live more mature than I did the day before. And that one day I cross that finish line of, of total maturity when I see Christ. But Paul says, I keep my eyes on that. Is that not what a runner thinks about? Is crossing that tape? And Paul says that. That's what I do when I live my Christian walk. I keep my eyes on growing up in Christ and being mature. How do you do that? Uh, well, how you do that, he details in Romans chapter 12 in great detail. In fact, he's given us so far uh, 12 commands of how to grow up in the faith, how to mature. Why? You need to press on to that goal of maturity. What do I need to do? Implement these 12 uh, commands into your life. And when you do that, you are what I've called radically righteous. You're, you're living in a radical way, this counterculture. My culture says the opposite of these things. Paul says, you want to grow up in the faith, you do the 12 things I just commanded you to do as a Christian. If you yawn at them as a Christian, you're not going to grow up. Paul says, no, you need to implement these things. We won't go through all of them because uh, we've been in them for several months. You should uh, not only know them, you should, you should be applying them. He's going to add some more today, uh, two more concepts. Uh, he's going to say, if you want to mature in the faith, press on to these two things. Number one, he says you should press on by being radically righteous toward those who face joy and those who face sorrow. This is a command to be happy when people are happy, be sad for them when they're sad. Which do you think is harder, the first one or the second one? What say you? We're going to vote. It's a, demo it's a democratic church at this point. You think it's easier to be happy when people are happy? Or is it easier to be sad when they're sad? What would you, would, who, how many would pick the latter? Are you guys asleep? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How many pick say it's harder to be sad when people are sad? You think that's it? Okay. All right. And how many of you say it's easy to, easy to be happy when people are happy? Okay. All right. Balcony, are you, I can't see you very well, so <laughs> hopefully you're interacting with me. Are you there? Can you hear them? Yeah, they're so spiritual. <laughs> Let's talk about this. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Um, the word rejoice uh, in Greek uh, is the word related to the, uh, it's a good morning in Greek. It's related to the word kairē. So if you saw somebody in Greek in the morning, you would say to them, kairē, equivalent to the Spanish, buenos dias, or the German, guten morgen, or guten tag, depends on what time of day it is, um, or to the Hebrew, boker tov, depends on what country you're at. But when you see somebody and you, you tell them, you know, have a joyful morning, should you look joyful? The word's all about looking joyful. Not looking downcast like, oh no, it's them again. Yeah, good morning. No, no. 
I've noticed, I've noticed uh, as I've traveled over to the Middle East taking people on archaeology tours, I always run into a lot of Germans over there. Uh, they're always in the hotel, uh, usually from, there's huge German Christian churches in Frankfurt uh, that I've run into when I'm over there. And as I get to talking to them and the Amy's, we, we have a good time. But it's really interesting. Uh, they, I've noticed that they've dropped the Guten, and, and it's just Morgan. Have you noticed this? It's just Morgan. I mean, it's like they dropped off the good part, and it's like they just see you at the food line, Morgan. What about the good part, the gluten part? Yeah, well, I asked the guy that one time. He's like, uh, we just basically just use the Morgan now. Okay, whatever. Is there good? I'm going with it. But you should be happy when you sell, tell somebody good morning, shouldn't you? Okay, all right. <laughs> what happened this week, baseball-wise? <laughs> See, now you're going to get happy. <laughs> now he's talking about something I know about. I'm a Dodger fan. I'm from California. Praise God for that team. <laughs> Go Dodger Blue. But anyway, <laughs> uh, 11 years ago, today was my first Sunday here. Did you know that? Yeah, so it's been, this is my 11th year anniversary it's today. So thank you. It's been fun. It was interesting coming from California here, wasn't it? My humor is different. You're different. I never met people from New York till I moved here. I mean, the people here are different. They're awesome. I'm still here. And I'm, having a, I'm having a great time. But my team did not win. <laughs> they imploded. I, maybe I didn't pray enough. I don't know what happened. <laughs> but they fell apart. And so, you know, I've been watching them since Vin Scully. I and mean, back in the day, you know, I mean, I was a kid. Because my dad was Dodger Blue. I was Dodger Blue. It's a whole family. They didn't, they didn't win. So, so, so your team won. No. Your team didn't win? <laughs> Three people, yeah. Yeah, your team won. So, <laughs> so people have stopped me today at church. They're like, wait, you're a former baseball player. Didn't you just like get into the series? No, not really. <laughs> I am from California. Nationals? Like, where's that from? Uh, no, I, no I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't watch all the games. I watched a piece or two here and there. It's kind of painful. But when it came down to the last game, my wife, Liz, who's not a sports fan uh, at all, and I don't watch games anymore because I don't really have time. And so, uh, so it came down to the last game, the seventh game. You know, it's three and three. It's the big game. This is history. I want to see this. Plus, I got to be able to talk to my church about this, right? <laughs> and so, and so we, you know, we got the TV going, set up, and we sat on the couch, had a moment. She sacrificed for me that night. We watched the game until the sixth inning. And I'm like, this is, a, this is a boring game. I mean, there's nothing happening here. It's two to zero. They're not hitting this guy. He's throwing sliders, curveballs, sinkers, this and that. It's hard to hit a guy like that, I know, as a former baseball player. Because if they're throwing 95 miles an hour at you, you only got like a second to react. And if they throw you a fastball high, in, you know, inside tight, and then the next one's like this change up, you're swinging three times to just try to hit the thing. So I told my wife, you know, just, just turn it off. This is boring. <laughs> Yeah, right. So we went to bed because I had to work Thursday and write my sermon, right? So I go to bed. So I don't know. It must have been about 1230. I woke up. I don't know if it was the Holy Spirit woke me up. I don't know what it was. <laughs> but I woke up and I thought, I, I should probably, you know, check my iPad, see what the score was. So I didn't have glasses on, so I can't see very well. So I turned the iPad on and I looked at it and, and it looked in my blurry vision like it was six to two. And I'm like, no, that can't be right. You know, so I, I got the glasses, looked at them and I'm like, it's six to two. It's a miracle. It's unbelievable. So I woke Liz up. She's like, what's going on? They won. We turned it off too soon. Now, w am I on a rabbit trail? No. No. I don't go on rabbit trails. Uh, no. So here's my, here's my point. Am I happy for you? Yeah. I have to be. <laughs> <laughs> Why? It's spiritual. What did Paul say? Rejoice. With those national fans who are rejoicing. <laughs> Woo! It's awesome! Too bad it wasn't the Dodgers, but I, it's, it's awesome! Now, so is, is, is it hard to rejoice with those who rejoice? Well, it depends. Doesn't it? I'll give you some ex illustrations. Um, so there's another officer ahead of you. You're a colonel, and you went to West Point together, and you know that you're a better student than he was at West Point. And you, you, you know you're probably a better officer than him because you're just better leadership material because you're humble. And... <laughs> I'm just saying. And, you know, and you get your third look to move up to the next rank, which would be a general. And, and you're excited about that. But you get your third look, and you're with him, and they choose him. And you're thinking to yourself, what are they thinking? I'm the better man. Are you rejoicing with him 
Nah, see, now all of a sudden you're getting quiet. Eh. <laughs> Loser. <laughs> Should have been me. No, no, all of a sudden you're not so re happy. Uh, let's, let's switch uh, areas from the, the military to salespeople. You're trying to close a, a, a deal with a, a defense contractor. It's a big one. It kind of make your career. And you're up against another company and their salespeople, and you know from other jobs you've had that you're, you're just, you know, you got the edge on this one because you're humble. <laughs> and they give the lucrative contract to your competitor. Do you call them with your joy? Hey man, hallelujah, praise God. I am so happy that you got the contract. You don't call them. Why don't you call them? That's another sermon, isn't it? Somebody back really tied in with me. Thank you. God bless you. Uh, another person uh, gets chosen for a lacrosse team that you played, tried out for, but you don't get chosen. Uh, you wanted a, a, that coveted spot, but you didn't get chosen. I, I was an athlete. I played. I've been through lots of tryouts. I know how it goes. You try out, and then the coach puts the list of who made the team on his, on, you know, it's on my door at 3 today. Everybody goes over there. The whole team, everybody's piled around the door. Yeah, everybody's looking for your name. I've been in lots of those where they told guys, you know, hey, uh, you're not, you didn't make it. And the guy just kind of saunters away. I mean, what guy that didn't make the team turns around to the rest of the guys who are high-fiving each other and goes, I am so happy for you. This is awesome. I never saw a guy do that. What did Paul say? This is counterculture. Rejoice with those who do what? Are rejoicing. Are rejoicing. A single person that you know gets engaged. And you've been single for years. And you're thinking, what? When am I going to get? Do, do you, are you happy for them? See, it's very hard to rejoice with those who rejoice. Why? Because we're people. Right? And we think about ourselves and what we need. And it's hard to focus on other people when great things are going for them. Here, here's a couple of examples with peoples that will show you just how you should not look when you're rejoicing with others, okay? <laughs> now you see, you see this? I do look long and hard for this. Okay, so see this guy? See this guy? What's he saying? I am so excited that you, yeah. No, he's not excited. He's like, oh, this is ridiculous, okay? Is that you? Uh, what did Paul say? Rejoice with those who rejoice. He needs to go to church. Okay, so here's, here's a lady. <laughs> I heard your daughter got married. That's just wonderful. My daughter's not married yet. I'm still wondering what's going on. You know, and et cetera. She look excited? No. She needs to go to church. Yeah, and, and learn. You, you need, as, if you're a Christian, you should rejoice with those who rejoice. What is, why should you rejoice with those who rejoice? We want to know. I'll give you some, uh, some reasons. Uh, number one, it shows you truly care about them. I mean, it, you're not fake. You're not phony. You really care about them if you rejoice with them. Number two, it shows that you believe in the sovereignty of God. Because if you didn't make the team and you're not on the team, God didn't want you on the team for whatever reasons. So what you're going to do with your life is better than you being on that team. See? Because why? Because you believe in the sovereignty of God. What's the sovereignty of God means? Well, it means that he, God, is in control of all things in your life. He knows best. Shows you believe in his sovereignty. Uh, and then third, this is not exhaustive, but third, if you rejoice with those who rejoice, it keeps your pride in check. Did you hear me? Boy, does it. If something's great is going on in somebody else's life, and they've done something amazing, and God has blessed them, and you rejoice with them, it keeps your pride in check. Right? I was thinking about it this week. Could you imagine if our politicians actually did this one? I'm, did you hear me? Could you imagine if they really did? When they accomplished great things for the nation, if the other side said, awesome, awesome, they don't do that. Either side doesn't do that. I submit that to politicians here in our country. It would make our country a great country. But that's what makes a great church. Is that when great things are going on in people's lives, whether they're a believer or not, that you, you got this going on, that you, that you hold your pride in check by thanking God for blessing the other person. So I have a question for you today because a sermon's about you imp implementing the commands. Simple question. Will you commit this day to rejoice with those who are rejoicing? Will you do it? Well, what should you do? I need some specifics. I'm an engineer. I need some details. Okay, good. How many engineers are here? Uh-huh. Confession. Okay. Here, this is for you. What should you do? Personally tell them you're happy for them without looking like that, that man or that woman. Okay? Number two, send them a detailed email. 
Did you hear me? Send them a detailed email. They'll never get rid of that off their desktop. Number three, post something uplifting on their Facebook page. Are you hearing me? Uh, four, actually go to the Hallmark store, find a card that's about said topic. Don't make the mistake of buying the wrong thing for the wrong thing. Okay? Make sure you read the inside of the card. I'm serious. Read the card, buy the card, write something awesome in the card, send it to them, and get a stamp, send it to them. They're, they're never going to get rid of that card. They're like, wow. I mean, they, they might be my opponent, as it were, but whoa, they stepped across the aisle and they loved on me. It's, ama it's amazing. Uh, and plus, they, it's going to cost you about seven to ten bucks to buy a card. <laughs> so they, they're going to realize you just made an investment. <laughs> what did Paul say? Rejoice with those who rejoice. It's kind of easy to do, but there's times when it's not. Will you be happy when other people are happy? Then he says, on the other hand, weep with those who weep. Uh, I've had plenty of that in my lifetime. In fact, I've had so much, I've had to tell the Lord, I think I get the Hebrews 12 thing, that whom the Lord loves, he chastens. Every son he loves. i like, Lord, I think I got the message. And God's always looking down from heaven going, mm, there's more you need to learn. Be sad with those who sad are saddened. Why? Because life's fragile. Life's hard. And let me give you some reasons why you should weep with those who weep. And I'm going to give you some illustrations from my life. And I know that I've told you these things before. But when significant things happen in your life that bring weeping and sadness, you never forget your friends that came alongside you at those times. You, you shall not. Case in point. Why should you weep with those who weep? Well, Paul, uh, uh, Solomon says in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 6 and verse 9, that two is better than one. It's not good to be alone. He says two is better than one. Why? Because when one friend falls down, what can the other friend do? He can come alongside of him and say, hey, man, you need, don't stay there. Now let me help you. See, two is better than one. Because there, there's a friend to come alongside the other friend to be strength for the friend. Before I moved here, uh, I had uh, two years that were off the grid in my life. Uh, the, 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 that one year, the first year, uh, my best friend, Pat Travnicek, uh, his son was a U.S. Marine. He was a mechanic on helicopters. Uh, I buried Justin one Christmas. That was a hard funeral when his Marine buddies came and his colonel. It was tough. Uh, and I was there with Pat and the family. I did, this, I did the service. Not knowing that a year later, I'd be burying Pat my best friend, from cancer, pancreatic cancer. That, that was a tough year. Remember the day that I went to Pat's house to tell Pat goodbye? And I took my dad with me, because my parents lived in town. I took my dad, a godly man, Al. He went with me. We went in, uh, said hi to Karen, his, Pat's wife, and Pat uh, knelt down over his, his uh, medical bed. He must have weighed 70 pounds. And I uh, read the scriptures to him, prayed for him. And I remember when I put my arms around his little bony body, and he, he, he couldn't even speak. Uh, he was going to die that day. And I put my arms around his little bony body, told him I loved him, prayed for him. And then I backed up after a few seconds to let my dad come in and do the same thing. And his little skinny little arms, my wrists are bigger than his arms at the back then. They wrapped around my neck and he, he wouldn't let me go. And I could feel him pulling me back in. What do you do then? <laughs> well, I went back in and hugged him longer. It was tough. But I had a buddy there. I had my dad there. I had, my, I had a buddy there. And so when I fa finally pulled away for the last time, uh, my dad then came in. Now my dad, you know, former federal agent in charge of hundreds of men, he had seen it all. Uh, there's not too many times in my lifetime I saw my dad cry. He did that day. We both cried next to Pat's bed. We, we cried all the way out of the house. We, had, we cried all the way across the parking lot. We cried when we got in my truck. But you know what? It was okay because two is better than one. Because I had another godly person alongside me. Why should you cry with those who weep? Well, it helps you identify with them and it brings strength. When you got a buddy, there's strength with a buddy. Uh, not knowing it, that was, the, that was that first of two bad years before I moved here. Um, the next year was, was most interesting. Uh, the year before I came here. Uh, because uh, the next year I'd be burying my dad. And my other best friend Rick two weeks apart. It was tough. So the one who had stood with me, my dad, when my best friend died, I'm now burying my dad. And when I'm burying my dad the next year from brain cancer, my other best friend, Rick Seeley, the head of homicide, uh, he has pancreatic cancer. He's dying. He died two weeks after my dad. But when my dad died, Rick called me one night when I was sitting on the patio, when I, just, when I got the news. 
after I, after I had seen my dad die and went home to kind of process what happened. And I sat on the back patio in the dark. Phone rang. I looked at the phone and it was Rick. This homicide captain, the head of homicide, calls me. Godly man. He didn't say much to me that night, but here's what he said to me. He said, hey, Marty, I heard what happened. My heart goes out to you and my prayers go out for you because I love you, man. That's all he told me. Some of the most profound words a friend ever told me was that little sentence. I'll never forget it. Two is better than one. But when that other buddy comes along and, uh, and shares his, your sorrow, in your sorrow, he understood that I just wanted the world to stop because my dad died. But the world's going to go on. But your friend says, no, I realize what happened here. And, uh, and I'm just calling to tell you that, I, that I'm standing with you. That mutual love and compassion is, is mind-boggling, is it not? You need it at that time. Proverbs says in Proverbs 17, 17, a friend loves at all times and a brother's born in adversity. You find out who your friends are when life goes south. And two weeks after I put my dad uh, in a casket and did his service, two weeks later I buried my friend Rick Seeley with all the police, all the highway patrol, hundreds and hundreds of people at his service. I buried him. I carried his body down the staircase in a body bag. He weighed about 70 to 80 pounds, and he was 300 pounds, a power lifter. And, and the young lady they sent with the truck to pick him up couldn't carry him. I was there. That was a hard time. But you know how you get through times like that? Well, I've got the hope of Christ. I've got the hope of Christ. And when it says you need to weep with those who weep, I get it. Because when I've been weeping, I've had saints come alongside me to help me stand up. And I've understood the value of coming alongside them to show mutual love and compassion to them because as Ecclesiastes says too, is better than one. Weeping also puts you in a position where you can give encouragement to people who have no hope. I mean, God sends tough times into your life so you can give encouragement. Uh, one time when I was a, a young pastor, the, I was at an elder meeting. Elder meetings go for hours and hours at any church you go to. Uh, and my wife always tells me when I come home after like a four hour meeting, what do you guys talk about all the time? Well, I can't tell you, it's like secret great, you know. And so I was at an elder meeting. It was going on for a couple of hours. The phone rang at the church, kept ringing, ringing, ringing. So finally one of the elders said, you know, uh, you know, your staff, you should probably answer that. So, so I did. Uh, and uh, the lady on the end of the line was a nurse at the local hospital in an ICU unit. And she said, um, are you the pastor? This is awesome. She said, I have a family down here that they, they don't have a church and they don't have a pastor, but their mother's passing away on a ventilator machine. She's going to die soon. Uh, they, they desperately need someone to come down here. I can't get anybody on the phone because of the hour. Could you, could you come? Well, sure. I could come. I'll leave an elder meeting anytime. Uh, yeah, so, <laughs> so I, uh, I told the elders, hey guys, you know, I don't know this family. I gotta go minister to them. So they said, great, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll carry on without you. So, um, so I, I drove down there. So what, you think it was awkward walking in the room with people I don't know? Mm -hmm. A whole room full of people around their mother. The, the, you know, the son, the daughter, the family. Never seen them before. Hmm. This, is a, this is a major moment in their lives. I understand it. Hmm. What, what am I supposed to do when I go down there? I'm supposed to give them hope. Hope. I don't have to talk a lot. In fact, less is better. So I walk in, greet them all by, you know, each one of them by name, who they are, get to introduce myself. And I stop and I, and I pray for their mother. And I pray for each one of them. Hmm. And I give them the hope of the gospel of Christ that he's the author of, of death and life. God might put you in a situation where you can rejoice with somebody who's rejoicing, then rejoice away. He might also put you in a situation this week, it's very tough. Someone's weeping. What should you do? You should come alongside them and, and show you love them by weeping with them. Been there, done that. That's a mature Christian. Lastly, Paul says, be radically righteous by being like-minded with other, with other people. Notice what he says. Be radically righteous by being low-minded, not high-minded. Be humble, not cocky. That's what he says. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own es estimation. Do not think it, you are all that in a bag of chips. Okay? Did you hear me? It's not in the Bible. It's just, I think that came from Texas or something. But uh, be of the same, what is he talking about here? Well, who's he talking to? He says, well, be of the same mind to one another. So is he speaking just to Christians? Uh, no. 
Uh, because just because he uses that terminology doesn't mean Christians are just specifically in mind. Uh, here I think he's talking about Christians and non-Christians. Uh, notice how he uses this, that, that uh, little prepositional phrase elsewhere in his writings. So 1 Thessalonians 3.12. Here's what Paul says. And may the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all men just as we also do for you. Uh, that whole concept of one another here is tied to believers and non-believers. That I should be of the same mind with them. Well, what does that mean? Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.15, Paul says, using the same grammatical construction, one another. So see that no one repays evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all men. You know, I'm, I'm responsible, as Paul says here, to be of the same mind toward other people. So does that mean that we're all supposed to believe the same things about everything? <laughs> That's not going to happen, is it? Do you think you could ever get D.C. to all believe the same thing about everything? <laughs> you put 20 Americans in a room, guess what you get? 20 different opinions. I mean, it's just, so that's not what Paul's talking about. What is he talking about? So we have to dive into the grammar for just a minute. So you with me? Yes. Okay. So I don't usually talk about it at this level, but we're going to talk about it this morning because it's important. When he talks about identifying with the lowly, there's two ways you can take that word. Uh, you can take it as a masculine, which it is. It is a masculine word, the lowly. Or you can take it as a neuter because the word that precedes it of being high minded is neuter. So if I take it as a masculine, what Paul is saying is as a Christian, you should identify with other people who are less than you, who don't have as much as you, who are lower than you, maybe socially, etc. Uh, they don't have the, the benefits that you've had in life, the lowly, the insignificant kind of person. You should identify with them, that they're important to God. So if it's masculine, he's talking about a person, a person. You take Uber? Yeah. Uber? Yeah. Do you know what Uber means, by the way? It means the over, to be the best, right? Like the highest. I had, a, I had an Uber driver when I was coming back uh, a month and a half ago or so, two months ago from uh, Disneyland. So Liz and I, uh, we couldn't get everybody in the car because of all of our luggage. And so we had two Uber drivers. And so they both showed up. And um, so I was talking to my Uber driver. He was from Ghana. And I was talking to him. And, uh, and because it's a Christian, you're supposed to show concern for the lowly, person different than you, le maybe less fortunate than you, less educated, whatever. They're, 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 they're important in God's eyes. And so I started off by talking to him about, do you understand what the word Uber means? No, I don't. So I told him. And I said, it's a good thing they didn't name the country Unter. <laughs> what would Unter mean? It's the bottom company. <laughs> it's the under company. He's like, this is awesome. He starts driving faster. <laughs> And then I found out, you know, about his family in Ghana, why he's here, who he's married to, how they met, etc. You're talking to him, what's your dreams and visions? He goes, hey, I got a master's degree in business. Huh? Whoa! Blew me away. I said, well, young man, what's your plan with your life? He began to share with me his life. Well, I go, that is awesome. I told him I was a Christian. I told him I was a pastor. I told him I'd pray for him. They never tell you, don't pray for me. They never do. See, Paul says, pay attention to the lowly. Who's that? You're an Uber driver. The young lady that seats you at the restaurant. Talk to her. Get to know her. You'd be amazed. The guy who's cutting your, your yard. You go outside and talk to him. Well, he, he, it's, only, it's only Spanish. Google Translate. I kid you not. I, I use it all the time. When I was in Dominican Republic a, a year ago, and they assigned a maid to us the whole time we were there, I couldn't speak with her. I mean, a little bit, but not talk. Uh, so I got the Google Translate thing going. She thought it was awesome. So we found out that her daughter was having a baby and it was, it was tough time for the daughter and could we pray for the daughter because I told her I was a pastor, I was a Christian. So we're praying for the, the maid in the kitchen and you see what you should be doing? I mean, not that I'm all that, but it's like I, I understand I must care for the lowly, didn't Jesus? Sure you did. Woman at the well, a Samaritan half-breed, nobody else would even walk in Samaria as a Jew. He walks in Samaria Broad daylight, meets a woman of all things at, at the well, talks to her. No Jewish man did that. And Jesus had, a, had an opportunity to minister to her. Uh, Jesus uh, found a, a woman caught in adultery that they were trying to, to stone to death. What'd he do? Oh, too bad for you? No. No, he stepped in and said, uh, who here doesn't have sin? So he showed grace. It says in the book of Matthew chapter 21 verse 32 that uh, Jesus was the friend of tax collectors and prostitutes. The lowly. See, if anybody could have been high-minded, it would have been Jesus. Now, he was low-minded. 
He went down to the lowest person and said, I love you. You're important to me. Do you have the same mindset as, as Christ did? The other way to classify the word is not that it's a masculine, but you can classify it as a neuter based on the fact that the concept of being high-minded is neuter. So contextually, you could say it's a neuter. Well, what does that mean? He's not talking about a person then. He's talking about an opportunity. What's that mean? Well, that you pay attention to lowly jobs that come along and you do them. Well, that's kind of beneath me. I, in my very first church where I was an educational director uh, in, in Arizona, uh, I, had to, you know, I had to fill all the educational structure of the church. So I had an older man that, um, that kept wanting to teach, wanting to teach, wanting to teach, wanting to teach. He had never taught before. He was about 70 years old. And so I said, uh, we, the only opening that we have is in the nursery department with the little children. You need to start there. I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. I want to teach adults. No. No, if you want to teach, you have to start with the children. That's where God has opened a door for you. He wouldn't do it. See, Paul says, you pay attention to the lowly. Who could that be? That could be a three-year-old. Now, they will wear you out. <laughs> I found out from my grandkids being here recently. Do they ever stop talking? No. Do they ever stop moving? No. Did they always take your iPad? Yes. I, why did I load games on there? Then I loaded games on my cell phone. They take my cell phone. Unbelievable. But go to the lowly. Who is that? Paul says, if you're godly and growing up in the faith, you're going to pay attention, well, to people. Well, that may not be where you're at in life, but since Jesus reached out to them, you should reach out to them. And when lowly positions come along, you should take them. You know what? We have a church that totally gets this. Because if you were here last night and you saw all the things that were set up in here and all outside in the bouncy houses and all the things, it was unbelievable. How'd that, you, how'd that get there? Do we have people from another church do it? <laughs> no. These are our folks doing the lowly thing saying, here I am, I can serve. I'll, I'll set that up, I'll clean this, I'll put this away. So when I drew, drove in the parking lot today, I told my wife and she dropped me off. Isn't this amazing? Servants, they get it. They get the lowly thing. Do you? What does Paul talk about here? Well, two things we need to pay attention to. Being radical when it comes to being joyous with people who are joyful and weeping with them when they're crying. And then also to do what he just talked about. What did he just talk about? Well, paying attention to, well, people that are lowly. Don't be arrogant and cocky. Be humble like Christ. Years ago, there was a football player. He's a kicker for the Chicago Bears. His name was Bob Thomas, 1984. 1984, the Chicago Bears let Bob Thomas go. He didn't take the news well. Uh, he was shocked that they let him go. And so when he went to the locker room to get, gather up all of his gear, uh, he waited till the entire team had left the locker room so he, he, he wouldn't have to face him. When he went into the locker room, there was one Christian buddy sitting there at his locker waiting for him. They'd been waiting for quite a while. His name was Walter Payton, the great running back. What was his nickname? Sweetness. Sweetness. Sweetness was waiting for him. Now they argue all day long on where that name came from, you know, but, but he was a sweet man. How do I know? Because he sat and waited for his Christian buddy who just got cut from the team to show up and get his gear. And, and Bob said when he showed up to get his gear and saw Walter standing there, when Walter stood up, Bob said, I went over and I leaned over and I embraced him and I put my head on his shoulder, his big old muscular shoulder. And he said, I cried like a little baby. Amazing, isn't it? What was Walter doing? He was weeping with a buddy who was weeping, was he not? It was amazing. That was 1984. 1999 when Walter passed away, Bob said this about his friend. He said, to share your grief with a Hall of Fame running back with, the kind of with that kind of compassion and empathy and ability is really the, my fondest memory of the guy that we called sweetness. Because he was sweet. Why? That big old Hall of Fame running back who everyone feared back in the day loved his friend enough to hang around to say, I'm going to be with you at a tough time. I'm going to walk you out of the locker room. We're going to be together. Two is better than one. Let's pray. God, thank you just for the clarity of scripture. Might it change how we think about ourselves, how we think about other people, how we move through life. Help us to truly pay attention to people like you did and to be excited for them, to love on them, rejoice with them, to be sad and weep with them when terrible things happen, uh, to give them strength and encouragement and hope and help us to always be mindful of the people around us that aren't quite blessed as we've been blessed but to think of them as, as an equal, of as a person, a human who needs our love and compassion because that was you. May we be your hands and feet. Amen.